my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. On a summer day, a group of children gather up their toy boats and rubber duckies and take them down to the lake shore to have a little bit of fun. And they launch their boats and their duckies on the lake, but it's a dull and windless day, and the duckies just drift around, and the boats go nowhere, and the children start to grow restless. This was not what they had hoped for when they came to the lake to play. Now, off to one side, one little boy, without malicious intent, really without much thought, something comes to him, and he, he reaches down, and he picks up a rock. And he weighs the rock in his hand and tosses it out into the lake. And the children look up in horror. Oh, no, what's going to happen? And even the little boy is thinking to himself, what have I done? What have I done? But the rock comes down, doesn't hit any boat or any ducky, and it splashes right into the lake. And the ripples start coming out from where it hits, and the boats start to dance gleefully on the waves that are made and the sunlight sparkles off the edges of those waves and the children are delighted. It is such a glorious and beautiful way to watch their boats come to life on this day of play at the beach. The little boy is worried that they might not like what he had did, but not realizing it, of course, the children loved it, and they came and embraced him and brought him down to the lake shore so that he too could play with them. Oh, the life of the ripple maker. (laughs) The Bible is full of ripple makers. We heard this morning this story of Elijah. And if you uh, have your homework assignment this week, go home and read 1 Kings and read the full story of this Elijah, uh, the full story of Elijah. He sets up a contest with the priests of Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal, and uh, to prove that his God is more powerful than the God of Baal. And they have this contest, and it's kind of gory. It involves bulls. You know how it is in the Old Testament. But Elijah is correct. His God is more powerful, and he defeats the priests of Baal. But they're not really good losers. And they drive, uh, with the help of Jezebel, they drive Elijah out into the desert, which is where we picked up the story this morning. Elijah had known that he needed to throw a rock into the Israelites who were beginning to drift to Baal, create some ripples so that they might defend and grow and reacquaint themselves with their faith. But it doesn't turn out well at first. Elijah is scared that they're going to kill him, that Jezebel's going to send people after him and they're just going to, they're just going to wipe him out and it'll all be for nothing. And then this beautiful story of Elijah in the cave. There's thunder and there's lightning and there's earthquakes and who knows what else. And he is in the silence, visited by God, given the strength. Uh, Bill, just mute my mic. I'll use this one. He's given the strength to uh, carry on. And he is, of course, the great prophet of Israel, held in such esteem and such a great prophet. You may remember on on the day of transfiguration in the New Testament, Jesus meets with Moses and Elijah on top of the mountain. That's how important the ripples were that Elijah sent out into the kingdom of Israel. Like I said, there's lots of ripple makers in the Bible. There's lots of ripple makers in history. I'm going to talk about two men who caused ripples that had incredibly long-lasting good effects on the faith. One is St. Thomas Aquinas. 
Aquinas was a 13th century scholar, Italian, and he uh, was already a, a great theologian and a, a great leader in the church, but of course, like all great leaders, some controversy followed him around. Why? Because he was throwing little pebbles, right? Into the, into the lake. People at first often don't like having pebbles thrown into the lake. But then he throws a really, really big rock into the lake called the Summa Theologica. All right? And it is a, a very large treatise using reason to analyze and to, he believed, move us closer to God through these incredible structures and frameworks that he creates in the Summa Theologica. And uh, let's see if I've got that quote from Aquinas. Uh, he argued that God is the source of both the light of natural reason and the light of faith. The Summa Theologica was, had an immense impact. It was, he wasn't the only one, but one of the major beginnings of the idea of scientific thought of using reason to approach God's world. And uh, as you know, uh, from people like Aquinas, uh, out came the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And God wasn't abandoned, right? Sir Isaac Newton was a faithful Christian, but it was seen as a way to... to uh, uh, um, get closer, to unearth, as it were, some secrets, perhaps, of God's world, to use the gift of reason to accomplish God's uh, purposes. Now, the Summa Theologica, as large as it is, went unfinished. Aquinas stopped working on it about three months before he died at the age of 50, and uh, here's what one writer says about that. On the feast of St. Nicholas in the year 1273, while celebrating Mass, St. Thomas received a revelation from God that caused him to stop writing, leaving his brilliant lifelong work, Summa Theologica, unfinished. He told his secretary, The end of my labors has come. All I have written appears to be as so much straw, after the things that have been revealed to me. Fulfill God's wishes through reason, and yet reason is not enough. Through revelation, St. Thomas moved closer to God. Just as Elijah moved closer to God in his revelation in the silence in the cave. St. Thomas made an incredible ripple in the world, and yet it was that connection with God that kind of went beyond the reason of Summa Theologica that in the end sealed his relationship with God. Our second story uh, involves Martin Luther, and it's one I'm sure you're pretty familiar with at this point, but I'll remind us. I mean, talk about throwing ripples. Talk about throwing rocks and creating ripples, right? Uh, we sang A Mighty Fortress is Our God this morning in honor of Luther. We had the 500th anniversary of, uh, the, uh, on Reformation Sunday a couple of years ago, uh, Luther's 500th anniversary of that. And, you know, Luther was a restless soul, but he was an Augustinian monk, and he uh, had dedicated himself to that life. His parents wanted him to be a lawyer. Thank God he became a monk is all I can say. But um, he uh, more and more and more believed that God's word was gifted to humanity through the Bible. Sola Scriptura. All you need to know about God you can find in the word of God in the Bible. Now, honestly, 500 years later, as Protestant Christians, this doesn't sound very radical to us at all. It's what we do all the time. But in Luther's day, the Catholic Church 
did not encourage reading the Bible. And most people couldn't read the Bible. So much, so many were illiterate. The priest would dispense any biblical wisdom to the congregation because it was in line with the doctrine of the Catholic Church. So Luther kind of um, uh, was really disgusted with this. God and the people are one. And he, he gets set off when bishops are, are basically bribing people to pay for their sins, literally with money, uh, so that uh, the bishops will forgive their sins, so that the bishop could build a new palace, a new cathedral. Very corrupt, very corrupt. But this set Luther off, and he finally has to go uh, before a, a trial before the pope and the popes, not literally in front of the pope, but the pope's representatives in the town of Worms. And he, uh, he goes through this trial, and they kept trying to get him to admit that he was a heretic and that he was against the pope. And really, they, they wanted to put him to death. They wanted to find an excuse to execute him. Uh, Jan Hus, who had been... Uh, uh, in the early part of the previous century, had been executed for complaining about when communion, when the priest would only give the wafer to the co people receiving communion, and they would keep the wine for themselves. These are the kind of things that were going on. And Luther ran out of reason. His arguments were good. But he finally said, when asked, do you recant? And he says, Here's dir ich, ich kann nicht mehr. Here I stand. I can say no more. And they did try to kill him. Luther's friends had to lock him up in a castle for a couple of years. He didn't want to, but he thought he was being kidnapped. But it was for his own safety, and he spent the, what do you think he did for two years? Did he mope around? He translated the Bible into German and made it available so that people very much like you and me could get direct access to God's word. And that was a huge ripple in Christianity. Coupled with the printing press, People could now read the Bible on their own. They did not have to accept that the priest had some greater knowledge of God and greater access to God than they did. Again, we take this for granted. Here in 21st century Vancouver, it was an immense upheaval. Thomas Jefferson once wrote to James Madison, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. His point in saying that was he feared that Americans would become complacent and they would become lethargic was the word he used about their freedoms and therefore would not defend them. Eventually, we would just grow so comfortable and so lethargic and take it all for granted that we would not defend the freedoms, the freedoms that Jefferson and many others had risked their lives for. Do we live in a time where we have grown lethargic about our faith, complacent, kind of take it for granted? And Well, just as Elijah and Aquinas and Luther found those to be very, very dangerous times, I would argue that we live in extremely dangerous times for our faith. And that whether we want to or not, remember, Luther was quite reluctant, Elijah was quite reluctant, but ultimately they picked up the pebble and threw it. They caused the ripples. You know, Jesus talks a lot about his followers being like sheep. And honestly, he does mean that in a good way, but quite honestly, historically speaking, we, we have been a little bit like that. And perhaps it's not always good, uh, because in just a few verses after Jesus says that in, in Matthew, he also warns us 
to watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. There are people out there who want to destroy Christianity. There were in Elijah, well, it wasn't Christianity, but they wanted to destroy the faith in Elijah's day, in Luther's day. Are there, are there people out there like that now? Before following someone, some person or some fad or some social uh, thing that seems uh, all over the media now, before following someone whose greatest expression is on something called Twitter, you need to figure out if that's a wolf. Is that a wolf? Or perhaps we are in even more danger if we don't figure out if they're simply playing to the wolf inside of us. Our complacency, our lethargy. And, of course, Jesus tells us how to tell the difference. He's, it's, it's actually a pretty easy formula. Look at the fruits. If the fruits are good, they're probably not a wolf. It's, good trees bear good fruit. Bad trees bear bad fruit. That's what Jesus says. Something that leads to violence and discord and the, and the degradation and desecration of the church and of Christ. Probably not a good thing, not a good tree. And Jesus backs this up with his life, right? He tells the disciples what he's going to do. There's no, there's no questions. He tells them what he's going to do. He, then he does it at a huge, huge sacrifice to himself. We live in an age where Christ is under attack. I'm sorry to be so bold and so blatant about it. It's not something I want to hear. It's not something you want to hear. But it is true. In this last week, in response to a leaked draft Supreme Court ruling, we have had people enter Catholic churches, destroy the tabernacle, the place where the body of Christ is held in Catholic tradition. Now, I don't really care what your opinion about abortion is. That is sacrilege. And they're not attacking it simply to protest. They would like Christ wiped off the planet. So what do we do? There's this marvelous video out there of another group of people who had entered a Catholic church for the same purpose. Advocates, I think they call themselves. But they come into a Catholic church during Mass, and they start uh, using language that would make a stevedore blush, all right, because they are so opposed to the Catholic church's stance. What do we do? How do we throw a ripple into that? What is our faith? A group of men simply line up. They kind of form a phalanx. No violence, no shouting. And they just push them out of the church. This is a sacred place. The body of Christ is sacred. It's an incredibly moving video as these advocates scream and yell and use language that you would never want your children to learn. Are they going to enter our church? I'm not sure that's really the point. Perhaps more to the point is, are we ready? Are we as ready as Elijah, as Luther, as Thomas Aquinas, as those men in the Catholic Church to say that if 
our faith isn't worth defending, what is? As this violence against Christians in America and around the world, quite honestly, it's at this point much worse around the world. And I sometimes imagine that our Jewish and our Muslim friends are thinking, well, welcome to the club. But I would also imagine, with a little grace, that they might also be thinking, and I'm sorry you're a part of this club now. Worth defending. Like Luther, like Aquinas, like many of the other ripple throwers, there is this moment of uncertainty. Did I do the right thing? And God rewards them in the silence with that touch of grace that says, yeah, that was hard. This world is uncertain and you are unperfect. But you did do the right thing. And I will leave you with this final thought. I want you to imagine that in the end, in the, in the end of ends, you are standing before the throne of God. And it is time for you to make an account of your life in front of God. Is it going to go worse for you if you admit that your attempts to bring the grace and light of Christ to others in this world, your attempts to defend your faith and defend Christ were failures? Or will it go worse for you if you have to admit to God that you never even tried? Amen.